Hey guys, this is MacKids101 with a different kind of video than what we usually make. Um, so today in this video, I'm going to be explaining an artificial intelligence concept that um, makes it possible for a program to optimally solve a Rubik's Cube. So if you're not familiar with what a Rubik's Cube does, it's basically just 20 pieces and 6 centerpieces which rotate along several different faces and after doing a few rotations it actually becomes very difficult to um, put back into a soft state with all the colors on the same side. Um, so I recently wrote a program which is capable of pretty quickly finding optimal solutions to a cube. If the cube is randomly scrambled it'll take a couple days but if it's something that you're looking for um, a solution to a neat pattern it'll usually find the solution relatively instantly. Um, so I'm going to be explaining how the concepts behind this uh, play out, how they work, and uh, this can obviously be applied to things different than the Rubik's Cube, but the Rubik's Cube will be our primary example. So the basic idea, um, which you would use to solve any puzzle if you weren't going to optimize it, um, is just to brute force a solution. And the act of brute forcing is your program has some kind of internal representation of the Rubik's Cube, and the way it tries to solve it is first it does uh, maybe a top turn and then a top counterclockwise turn and then a right turn and a left turn then a down turn and if none of those uh, solve the cube then it tries a top turn a right turn a top turn a left turn a top turn a down turn and it basically tries every single possibility so it tries all the one move solutions the two move solutions etc etc and that's basically how it works and a slight modification to this would be to use something called a search tree and just using a search um, by itself is still kind of brute forcing but the general picture as I have right here is that you start out with your scrambled state up here and then you try making an R, you try making a U and you get all these cubes uh, these different configurations out from doing that and then from each of those configurations you expand one of these to then make an R and a D so this is just the brute force model we've seen and you might keep on expanding it and expanding it and trying more and more um, nodes down until you finally get to a solved cube and then you just trace your way back see what you did to get there and you can um, print out the solution that you had to have used to get to the solved state so pretty obviously this will find an optimal solution because first it will go through all the one move solutions then the two move solutions until it's possible to, for the cube to be solved however after about seven or eight moves um, it will take a long long time to find a solution and for a random scramble of a Rubik's Cube, it can usually take between 16 to 18 moves to actually solve a random scramble. So the, the problem becomes figuring out how to take this brute force model and still utilize the idea of brute force um, or of, of just like searching in order to find a solution. But at the same time, you have to make it so you can eliminate some stuff that you're searching for. Because as it is, if there are 18 different ways you can turn a cube, counting double turns as a turn, then there's like 18 to the 8th power possibilities if you're doing 8 turns. And that's already too many for a computer to go through and do very quickly. Um, so the solution to this is using uh, different teeny small sub-problems of the cube to reduce the number of moves it will take. So the way you basically do this is for instance let's say I took this cube and I'll solve it real quick you take the cube and you look at the corners alone so if you just look at the eight corners and ignore the edges you still if you, the cube is solved all the eight corners will be solved but if all the eight corners are solved that doesn't necessarily mean the cube is solved however it takes 11 moves maximum to solve all the corners and I know this after having written my program you shouldn't necessarily know that but the, the, the reason why it's important that it takes 11 moves is that that's actually something that's accessible to a computer. 11 moves, okay, maybe it would take a while to solve the corners without any optimization, but it would certainly be possible and it would only take a couple days if you were still like on a decent computer. Um, so the way you utilize this aspect to solve a Rubik's Cube optimally is you have a program or in this case I wrote a program that I ran on an Amazon server for a couple days you could run it on your computer or do whatever and what the program will do is it will keep on messing up a cube so it'll do an R then a U then an R then an L then an L then a U you know it try it messes up cubes again and again records the configuration of the corners 
and records how many moves it took to get the corners into that configuration. So after running this program for a couple days, I got a giant, well, it was actually like half a day or two a day, but I wrote a couple different programs for a couple different uh, sub-problems like this. But the corners is the example I'm going to be using. So after running this program, you'll get a little database. And this database will have all the different corner configurations, and it'll say how many moves it would take to just solve the corners. Now, it would have to take at least that many moves to solve the entire cube. So if I gave you a random scramble and you saw that the corners took seven moves to solve, you would know that it would take at least seven moves to solve that cube from that messed up state. Now, why is this useful? Well, if you recall our search model here, which I have in front of us, you'll realize that let's say I'm searching for a one move solution. So I make all these one moves, not much I can do there to optimize it. But now let's say I'm looking for a 10 move solution, right? And I make two moves here, and I'm at this scramble that's the scramble and then I did an R and then I did an L, right? So I managed to get to this scramble. And now I have eight moves left that I can make in order for this solution to be 10 moves. Well, if I look at the corners and the corners take nine moves to solve, then I know that I don't have to look any further past this node and I can just eliminate it. So here's a slightly more complicated graph of just what it might look like. And let's say I'm looking for a 10 move solution because my program's gotten up to 10 moves. It knows that it's no less than 10 moves because it's tried all the nine moves already. Um, so it goes and it does a B and then it does a BU. And let's say after it does a BU, it realizes, hey, this is gonna take nine more moves and I've already done two moves, so that's too many, so I don't have to search this. Well, suddenly I don't have to look at this node and I don't have to look at anything branching off of it. So it can just vanish and it simplifies the graph and it lowers the work that the computer has to do. And usually this will happen a lot. Like here, the R plus D, maybe that's more than 10 moves, so it can get eliminated too. And as it makes a third move, more things will get eliminated and more and more stuff. And eventually it will have looked for all the 10 move solutions by using this method. And then it'll move on to 11 move solutions and then some of the stuff that didn't, that got eliminated before won't necessarily get eliminated right away the next time. But so using this corners database, you can essentially uh, like prune the search tree is what the, the actual term is. You can cut back nodes that you no longer have to search. And uh, when I actually wrote my optimization for my program, I have a corners database. Then I have a database with six edges and six other edges. And then I have a database that keeps track of edge orientations, which is something that people who solve a cube a lot will be familiar with, but people who don't won't. So I won't go into great depth explaining this. But basically, it makes it so that um, the program can eliminate lots of stuff that it's searching and will be able to find a solution that maybe is 18 moves, but it will be able to do it really quickly because it can eliminate nodes and you know it only has to search things that are like minute possibilities. So this was just a little introduction to how some artificial intelligence uh, searches work. Um, so if you found that interesting, maybe you'll consider taking computer science, I don't know. But this is basically what artificial intelligence is all about. So thanks for watching MacHeads 101. Subscribe and goodbye.